So I thought I would look at a neighborhood, a city, another state that is different than Los Angeles and see what they're dealing with and if I can connect the dots and if it has any similarity to what is happening in Los Angeles County. And scary as it seems, as it is, it is like a mirrored image of what is happening in Los Angeles County. And then when I look at other states and other cities, they all seem to connect. So this right here is talking about Salt Lake City. And you'd think it would be a place where, you know, everybody's doing well, you would assume. And even the people who don't make a lot might be doing okay and they're able to, you know, make ends meet. However, it is the opposite. And it is like a mirrored image of what has happened and is still happening in Los Angeles County. So building Salt Lake. So the city's displacement consultant, now this right here, it says drop data, a data bomb, that there is nowhere to go for the displaced renters. That sounds a lot like what is happening here in Los Angeles County. We have homelessness that is growing every week. And it is very evident that this is a crisis. It should be announced as an emergency. Just like they announced the COVID and the monkeypox, Homelessness should be declared an emergency. And not on just a city or state scale, but a global U.S. A U.S. crisis. <clears throat> And I believe it might be even outside the same things are going on, but maybe in different places. But looking at the U.S., this is definitely a huge, huge problem. So here we have it. Luke Garrett, July 18, 2022. So this was not that long ago, so it's fairly recent, this article. But it points out some real real concrete evidence that many people are rent burdened. Even though you know through antidote and experience that something is happening doesn't mean that those impressions are true across the board. The city's department of the community and neighborhood the city council received the result last week of an impressively data rich multi prong community survey that confirms the worst fears of policymakers at lower income city rents. So not only are the rents rising, are the rising rents in affordable neighborhoods driving out low-income people. But the region provides very few options. This sounds exactly like L.A. County. Very few options for finding a new home nearby. They'll become homeless, they'll double up, or they'll leave the state altogether. 
a consultant who has studied displacement nation and worldwide, told the city council. So this is something that I have never seen before. Some of the study's findings with a rapidly growing population and a housing inventory that is mostly suburban and narrowed by geography, housing stock on the Wasatch front provides few, if any, safety valves for people who have lost their housing and are looking for something cheaper. The Urban Displacement Project. Now, this is out of UC Berkeley and Bear Driscoll Community Planning. Firm collaborated with two graduate classes in the Department of City Metro Metropolitan Planning at the U of Utah to produce a study that involves complex data sets and manipulation of variables, grassroots outreach using community liaison focus groups, including one of unsheltered people, workshops with youth and face-to-face -face surveys, the general public. So the result can be found at the thriving place of slc.org under what we heard and learned. Rent is dominating many household budgets. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau, American Community Survey data from 2015 to 2019 a whopping 50% of renters in Salt Lake City are cost burden. In that, they pay more than 30% of their income on rent. So that's one quarter of the city's population as 50% of its residents are renters. So that's half. One quarter of the renting population may spend 50% or more of their income on rent. These severely rent burdened residents are most likely to be displaced, the study result has said. So Salt Lake City household rent burden, and it has a graph of those people that are most affected. And so you may not be able to see the graph to its entirety, but this is how it looks by color. So, <clears throat> percent of income going to rent. So 30% to 50% is in the blue. And over 50% is in the what looks like a red, red color. And then the percentage of income going to rent and rent burden equaling 30% of the income to rent. So that's what this graph is picturing here. So you see that there's a lot of more people who are not able to really live comfortably or feel secure about their living situation without worrying about paying the rent. So one half of all the renters in Salt Lake City are cost burden and one quarter pay 50% or more of their income in rent. Affordability and displacement trends are eye popping. So the image below is a map that, that studies affordability and likely displacement indexes. And so they do have a map that are maps that you can look at that have to do with displacement. And so the affordability index is calculated by aggregating the total number of households that are low income region wide, extremely low income and very, very low income are set at 50% AMI and moderately low income at 80% average medium income. income. 80% and dividing it by the number of rentals 
that they can afford to move to and in the area. So likely displacement index will show the red hash mark that indicates those census tracts. And so these were basically surveys that they did over time that show the people and the numbers, people who are displaced and the numbers of people who are at risk of displacement. And so <clears throat> an out -mi migration of low income people and also shows indications of people that are over 60 variables that the displacement is likely to continue. So the maps don't look very good for the affordability and availability. And I would bet that this is not the only map that looks horrible in terms of affordability. It's also here in Los Angeles County as well. And so the reason why I'm doing this is because this is a stark resemblance of what, what is happening all over in many of the cities and many of the states in the U.S. And I don't think it's by accident. It's a collective event and it's catastrophic and it is an emergency. And I believe it's calculated and it is direct. It is another form of attack. And it is a way to put people out on the street or worse. And that is my true feeling. I believe that this is like a horrible cancer that people had overlooked they weren't really taking it serious and now it has grown and it is out of control. And now people want to take, some people want to take it a little bit more serious and then others are still not convinced that the damage is getting far worse than what we have anticipated. And people won't really realize how bad it is until they're on their last leg. And that is how this housing crisis has gotten. It's a problem that is so bad that they now are resorting to criminalizing people for being homeless. And I understand that people want safety, but this is what happens when you start pricing people out, when you make things unaffordable, when you're calculated and you're targeting the black and the brown communities the communities of color, and when it is targeted because of agendas that have to do with trying to put people in vulnerable situations, then crime is going to rise. Then it is going to be unsafe. Then you're going to have more crimes of desperation. And yes, you're going to see people do things that they probably normally wouldn't do had they had a place to live or if they had more food to eat, or if they had more opportunities that they're not being allowed to have or given because they're busy trying to find a place to sleep. And so this is what we're faced with. And I really do believe that some people sat around their table and they had maps and they knew which neighborhoods they wanted to target. And these people had an agenda in mind. And some looked at it as for the sake of money, while others looked at it as not only a money venture, but also it was targeted for the specific biases that they hold against certain people or communities of color. And so this was calculated. And this is, this is a national disaster. We are looking at it in real time, and this is not being talked about enough. And anytime you have a place like Salt Lake City, who is also experiencing the same exact pattern, then you know that it is not, these are not just coincidences. This was plotted, it was planned, it was methodical, and whoever and whomever these people are, they know who they're targeting. They're not going to the wealthy neighborhoods and fixing those up. 
they're going to the neighborhoods where they know people are already struggling and they are making the place unlivable so that you can afford to live there. And then when you look for other places to live, it is the same deal. So the maps don't look good for affordability and availability. One of the hundreds of census tracts oged in to Provo, only five are currently affordable to people making 50% of the AMI, and they aren't experiencing displacement, or at least not as of yet. So two in RM, one in Leyden, and two in Ogden. And so I believe these might be little areas that are in the Salt Lake City uh, region. And so there's a map that it, it's underneath. And so this is like a, a, a smaller version of the bigger version of the map where it shows the boundaries, the, the red line zones. So they actually have drawn a red line. It shows you affordable at 80% AMI, affordable at 50% AMI, the segregation. These things that we thought were a long time ago, they never left. They just had new names for them. The new name is getting priced out of your community, which is the new red line is what it is. And so if you draw your, take your red pen around those areas, you can see where those areas are being targeted. So a lot of people are being displaced out of their homes and this is not something to take lightly. So very few census tracts in Salt Lake City are staying affordable to people making 50% or lower of AMI. So this is the courtesy of the Urban Displacement Project in Salt Lake City, so they've been following this. So the city is getting whiter. Disproportionately, it's people of color who are 50 to 80% AMI can't afford the rising rents. So new move-ins are more often white than people they replace. Notably, the Pacific Islander community has the largest share of its population living in tracts with displacement risk in the city state, states this study. So the middle class gets squeezed while the bottom falls out. The competition for housing in Salt Lake City and the region is fierce. So there are three people at 30% AMI for every one unit available or affordable to them. So this right here is renters and affordable units by income groups and renters households and rental units. So it also shows uh, numbers. They're small, but you can basically see. So it's color coded. And so if you don't even look at the numbers, extremely low income is in the red, okay? The higher incomes are in the orange. Now, to the, to the uh, purple color is the moderate income. So anything at the top is, is the highest. Purple is moderate income. And then when you start getting into the low incomes, it's the green and anything far below it in blue and red is the very low to extremely low is in red. And so to the right is the renter households. Okay. So you see there's renter households and you'll see all of the numbers of people and the incomes. And then rental units is to the to, well, no, rental units is to the right, and to the left is rental, renter households. So if you look at the left side, because I'm trying to picture where you'd be sitting, 
but you can see where it shows renters and affordable units by income groups. And so it's grouped and it's color coded and maybe I guess you can see it as clear as I'm looking at it. You know, because sometimes the graphs don't come up very clear, but the reactions and the proposal. So at the same time, Salt Lake City renters population is top heavy. The study notes that people making 120% AMI, the higher incomes, the largest group of renters, okay? But the supply of the housing at the top end of the affordability scale is at very less demand. And so <clears throat> less than demand, causing high income households to rent units below their price point. So taking the units that are affordable to low income and very low income households off the market. And so the people that make the higher incomes will take the cheaper apartments. Get it? And so there's not very many units that are available that are affordable. And so the lower rents, the people who make the higher incomes, they, they get lucky or they're fortunate enough to, to snag those places. And then the, the places that are really expensive, that's what's out there and the people who make lower income can't afford it. So that is also a problem where you have people who are high income earners and they're taking the affordable housing or the housing that is discounted and so they need to put some kind of regulation on that. Um, so that won't happen as well because that takes away from people who could really benefit from that. So the reactions and proposals, the results are a call to action led by David Driscoll told the council, okay, Given the city's aggressive use of available funds for affordable housing for at least the last five years, council members likely didn't need to be told. So they just passed the mayor's budget that included over $20 million in new spending on affordable housing. Yet the wealth of deep organized data presented at the council's July 12th work session seem to shock some councilors. So council chair Dan Duggan called the results scary, while District 5's Darren Mano professed to be terrified by the numbers of what he was seeing. So the AVS, Chris Wharton, asked Timothy Thomas, research director of UC Berkeley Urban Displacement Project, aren't a lot of cities experiencing this? I could tell him, yes, they are, which is scary. And so where, where there are no more affordable neighborhoods, what is different from what you've seen before? So in other areas he studied, Thomas said, often there's a place for people to be displaced too. But often that's a community that is 40 to 50 miles away. Because the way the Wasatch Front is built up, it's a very rural area and there's no neighboring town or suburb with affordable options. So that would force a person to have to leave the that state altogether, make a drastic move just to find somewhere they would assume would be more affordable. So the next step for the consultant is to present the action items to the city in a form that is both pro-development and pro-tenant. And they acknowledge that some of their proposals are currently forbidden in Utah's state code. So when asked about the consultant's post-report meeting at City Hall, Thomas told us there's definitely an 
appetite to make good, but a lot of limitations are at state level. So in all honesty, it's really dire. So business, as usual, in Salt Lake City will increase displacement and homelessness without a doubt. And so they're anticipating more homelessness growing in Salt Lake City. That's how bad it is. And so you see here what they were talking about, the displacement. And so <clears throat> So when asked about the post report meetings at City Hall, um, Thomas told us there's definitely an appetite to make good, but a lot of limitations are at state level. And in all honesty, it's really dire. So business as usual in Salt Lake City will increase display, displacement and homelessness without a doubt. And they're going to have to use a lot of ingenuity to solve the problem. And it's not going to be an easy one. So that's basically the whole article on this Salt Lake City issue for their issue having to do with displacement. So that just goes to show you that anywhere I have looked, I had said, okay, let me look over here and see what they're dealing with. They're dealing with a similar issue. It is like a mirrored situation. And so that, that brings me to this thing here. If you got cities that, where they're unaffordable to live and you don't have anywhere to stay, and it was the only place that you knew. And then homelessness begins to increase. Crime begins to increase. And desperation begins to increase. But there's no one solving the homeless issue by bringing in more affordable living. Then what do you have? It's chaotic. And then you would rather be fine with watching people live in shanty substandard, maybe even unhealthy living quarters. Or like I read in the other article where there was a city where they were okay with a tent city for the people who didn't have anywhere to go. They were okay with seeing people living out of a garage. This is truly disturbing. And that is why I believe that this is 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 an, a national emergency. This is an emergency. Anytime you see people that are displaced, but they have nowhere to go to when they're displaced, that's how you know that this situation is really, really, really out of control. And so some of the things that they've been seeing are a majority of the things they've been seeing in this, this town is the same things that we've been seeing here in L.A. County. When I look at other cities in other states, they're having similar issues. That's why it brings me to the conclusion that it is calculated. Some people were sitting down and they knew what they were doing. They knew where they wanted to, to start this, this project. I had a friend a few years ago. He was telling me that he had saw a blueprint. And I said, blueprint of what? And he said he saw a blueprint and he saw the people that he knew that were talking about what they were going to do to downtown Los Angeles here in California. And the blueprint got bigger and bigger and bigger. And basically, it was a blueprint of gentrification. And it isn't just a group of yuck, yuppie people that come in and take over. It's bigger than that. 
there are people behind the scenes that have blueprints and they have maps and they've already targeted the areas where they're going to buy property and where they're going to build new property or where they're going to change things or where they're going to take over certain uh, places that, you know, you have people fighting to keep preserved because it's part of the community and they're fighting to take it away and they're using their money to do it. And the money seems to be winning. That's the sad part of all of this. And so if you just come here in California and you come to the Los Angeles area and you go and drive down Crenshaw, you'll see businesses that are just boarded up. And those new businesses that are being built right on top of them or over them, or they're doing a lot of digging up places so they can start all over again and the money is winning because the people that have been struggling they've been there and they weren't putting money into these cities because of racism i really do believe that's why they weren't funding these cities they wanted to see the failure so that they can come in and pounce and swoop in and take those properties so we had a young man who was murdered and he had bought his property and they have done everything in their power. The people that are running that area have tried to do everything in their power to try to take it away from him. He was trying to build some more property or buy more property so it could be for the community development in that area. And I'm talking about Nipsey Hussle. And he saw something also that was happening in his community. And it was spreading and it was happening all over Los Angeles County. It's happening where it's spreading, where now you see properties, where you see places that used to be maybe a local car wash or it used to be maybe a store or it was a mall and it has been completely turned over to someone else and you still haven't figured out what they're going to do with it yet. But the money is what took it. And greed, and I really do believe that racism is baked in this. Because the areas that they have been coming and gentrifying are areas of people that live here are black and Latin people and people of all walks of life that are, you know, have been here since they were kids. And now you're having to reevaluate, can you afford to stay here? And it's the same thing that I'm seeing in this article about Salt Lake City. And a lot of people have been rent burdened for the longest time. And now they're trying to decide what they're going to do in their living situation if they're going to be able to maintain where they live. And <clears throat> when you see articles like this, you're thinking, if you see like maybe one or two articles, you think, oh, it's not as big as it seems. It's not as bad as it seems. But when you see them in places far out that you would think nothing is going on there, they're not having the same problems that they do up here in the city. But when you see that the same issue is happening in other states and other places, you can't tell me that these people are collectively working together to make this thing happen. It has grown. You notice how more people in areas that you wouldn't have thought are homeless there. I'm telling you, it's connected. It's all calculated. And, you know, the friend that was telling me that he saw the blueprint, he said he saw a blueprint and he said, oh, this is going to affect so-and-so. This is going to affect so-and-so, you know. 
he was already seeing who it was going to affect. And, in, and most of the people it affects is people who are black and people who are Hispanic and people who are Asian and people who are Pacific Islander and people who are low income and don't make that much money. It is affecting. So they keep wanting me to talk about all these things that deflect from what is really going on in the world. And you have to get smart and you have to realize that these things are not coincidences anymore. Somebody's doing something and they've been plotting and they've been planning and they've been organizing and what they've been doing is now starting to affect thousands, if not millions of people are going to feel the brunt of all of this. And even if you make enough money and you are living okay, you're still going to be affected some kind of way because, you know, when you have people, hundreds of people that are hurting and they have no place to sleep in or, or they're sleeping in a garage, you best believe crime's going to go. Don't think beyond a shadow of doubt that that's not going to be in the cards. It does make it unsafe. Because those are not crimes because people just want to go out and do bad things. Not all of them are like that. If you see people that are stealing food or they're breaking into homes that doesn't justify the acts so much that it saying that it's okay to do that. No, it isn't okay to do that. But those crimes, they're looking for money. They're looking for something so they can eat, so they can get a room for the night. Those are crimes of desperation. The snatch and grabs, let's get something so we can sell it. Those are crimes of desperation. That's what those are. They're not crimes that, oh, we're bad people and just we just want to go out and create mayhem and havoc. Misery on other people's lives. So yeah, there you have it. So many people are now rent burden. But I would say it's more than 50% of what you're paying and having to go to rent here in LA County, I would say it'd be a bigger, a larger number. I'd say it'd be 80 to 95, almost, almost close to 95% of, of your take home income is, is if it isn't for any other bill than a car note, the rest of it is for rent. 